seeing let the Spirit breathe new life into us. Good morning, everyone. I think probably one of the best gifts given to the church is the Holy Spirit. He came down, established a New Testament church, and he makes sure that the gospel is preached to everywhere in the world. He provides people and gifts for the church as a corporate body and also as an individual believers. And yet, we often don't hear much about the Holy Spirit in the sermon or in the, in the preaching. Uh, there are many good reasons for that, but it is good to uh, sometimes or even often hear about the works of Holy Spirit in our lives, in the lives of the church. Even in the history of Christianity, sometimes the creeds, the statement of faith, doesn't mention much about the Holy Spirit. Last week we read about the uh, Apostles' Creed. There's a long sentence about God, the Son, and God the Father, but only one sentence about the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit. That's all. Uh, and then the later on. Uh, some people will say we don't talk about the Holy Spirit because the primary works of the Holy Spirit is to focus on Christ. Christ is on the center stage and uh, Holy Spirit is like our people sitting at the back uh, focusing on that. Uh, and there are many other reasons. Uh, but as we go to the book of Acts, we know that another name that can be given to Acts of the Apostles is the Acts of the Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The whole book of Acts is actually built on Acts chapter 1 verse 8. You receive power. You are empowered by the Spirit, directed by the Spirit, led by the Spirit to share the gospel uh, all over the places to all kinds of people, all worlds of life. And yet, why we talk about Holy Spirit now? Uh, the reason is because in the passage that we are going to listen, there are specific mentions of the guidance, the leading directions of, of the Holy Spirit, on Paul and his team. But before we, we uh, uh, continue that, I would like to start with three, three basic understandings about Holy Spirit in the lives of the church and our uh, personal Christian life. Number one, Holy Spirit is a person, not only a power or a force. Oftentimes we forget we, when we talk about Holy Spirit, we talk about the power of Holy Spirit, then we think it is only a force or a power in our lives. No, just like the person of God the Father, the person of God the Son, Holy Spirit is also a person. And now the third person of the triune God is living and working in his church in the world. Number two, that Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And for the believers, if you are not a believer, uh, the Spirit, Holy Spirit doesn't live in you, but this person of Holy Spirit lives inside of us 24 7. Can you imagine that? That person lives inside of us all the time. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, we all know that, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Spirit, that he lives in you? It can be a corporate body of Christ, but also an individual Christians. And I specifically really touched by what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He talks about when you come to faith, 
the spirit of God will be united with our spirit. If you read 1 Corinthians 6, 17. And this is, this is like a mysterious, mystical union we have where the spirit of a believer is united with the spirit of God. He lives in us. And Paul talks about this first when he talks about the relationship between husband and wife. There is a mysterious, mystical relationship between a man and woman. Two become one. And then he talks about like that. The Holy Spirit is united with our spirit. Number three. So number one is a person. Number two, he lives within us. Number three is he desires to always communicate with us. He's a person. He wants to talk to us. He wants to teach us. He wants to counsel us. He wants to remind us. He, uh, John 16 says, he leads us into all truth. He convicts the world of the sins. Sometimes he will remind us. We'll talk about that of the things that we shouldn't do in our lives. So that spirit that lives in us 24-7 is also the person who is desiring to have fellowship with us. 1 Corinthians 7, if you read the message uh, uh, version, he said he wants to have an open communion with the believers. So sometimes when people think God is far away, God is close, it's probably not the exact correct one because God is always with us. He lives in us. He goes wherever we go. So I said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. With this in mind, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for bringing us to, uh, again today to worship you and also to be reminded again about the third person of the triune God, Holy Spirit, living inside of us, and how he guides and leads Paul and his team, but also to us as believer who lives now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The topic for today is leading of the Spirit. Maybe you see about led by the Spirit, Spirit-led life. Um, as I said, uh, that Holy Spirit has desires to lead our lives. And the stories, the principle will be based on Acts chapter 16, verse 6 to 17. For those who are preceding us, we are preaching through the book of Acts. We have come to Acts chapter 16. And last week we heard that Paul, uh, having led by the Spirit, having desired to visit the churches they have planted in uh, southern Turkey, and he recruited Tim, Timothy, Silas, and they went up north. Uh, we'll see the map uh, later. And they went to strengthen the churches, but then they were led further up north. They went, what it like to go to preach the gospel in Asia. Asia at the time is different from Asia now. It was a, a small area in, in Turkey. Uh, but they were prevented by the Spirit. They went up north. They want to go to northeast, to Bithynia, Cappadocia. They were again be prevented by the Spirit. They came to a town called Troas. There they slept, and the Holy Spirit uh, revealed that there was a vision for Paul uh, from Macedonia across the sea. The next day, he shared the vision with his friends. They all agreed. They crossed the sea, and that was the first time the gospel entered into Europe by Paul. Uh, so there is one significance of this, this story today. Is, is the first time the gospel was brought into European soil, uh, into, into uh, Greece. And secondly, this is the first time we read here uh, where Luke uses the word we. That means he joined Paul's and his team for the first time. He probably is the resident of Troas. He heard the gospel. He came to faith. He joined, and he was used mightily to write down the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. What are the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives? 
based on the stories, you can list down lots of things if you study the whole New Testament and Old Testament. But based on the story, there are three things. Number one, the Holy Spirit will do preventing to say no. Holy Spirit will permit or to direct you to uh, say yes. And then he will also provide people and things and other as he leads and he directs. Uh, let's uh, lead, uh, study one by one. Uh, preventing, saying no. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia uh, and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit. His companions were Titus, uh, Silas, Timothy, uh, and probably many others, uh, from preaching the word in the province of Asia, which is the region in the left uh, nearby the Mediterranean Sea, uh, Ephesus, Colossae, those cities uh, were called Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, he tried to enter to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. So the word Holy Spirit and the, the uh, Spirit of Jesus refer to the same person, the person of uh, the Holy Spirit. We might ask these questions. How were they prevented from doing this? Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't clearly say in the text how they were prevented. But from the broader context, from the whole story of the Book of Acts and the missionary journey of Paul, we can say uh, that, oh, let me uh, explain this. So this is from Antioch. They went to this area that we had last week. And they came to this area here where they want to go to Ephesus or Asia. They were prevented. They uh, kept north, and they want to go to Bithynia. They were kept, prevented, and they, come, they came finally to this town of Troas here. First, maybe because of the counsel given by his friends, his team members, not to do so. One of the team members is Silas, and Acts chapter 15, verse 13 says that Silas has a gift of prophets. He, he is a prophet. He might receive the word from the Lord to say, Paul, let's not go to Ephesus. Uh, I felt the Lord speaks to us not to go there. And um, in the lives of Paul, there are many times when prophet came and warned him not to go to certain places. Uh, when he, Paul spoke to uh, the elders in Ephesus, later on we learn in Acts chapter 20, uh, he was going up to Jerusalem, and there was a prophet called Agabus, came and said, he had the belt of, uh, of, uh, of Paul, and he said that the man who has this belt will be arrested, will be bound like this. He warned Paul not to go to Jerusalem. But Paul has made strong decisions, I will go to Jerusalem anyway. And there he was arrested. We know all uh, the stories. So it might be that the, the uh, good counsels given by friends, close friends, uh, friends who has the gift of discerning, receiving the word of the Spirit, there might be some circumstances that happen along the way. Uh, we just don't know. Maybe there was disagreement among them as well. Or there are some challenges, opposition, strong oppositions. Maybe there were coming from Asia. You better not come today. There are Jews here. They are ready to kill you now if you enter into this area. Uh, so we don't know, but... There, there can be counsel, there can be circumstances, uh, inner uh, impressions that prevent them to go uh, there. And uh, so then we ask the questions, why? Why will the Holy Spirit prevent you to preach the gospel to a certain place or certain group of people? Uh, 
you might study in your group tonight or next week and come with more reasons. Uh, I could think uh, some of the reasons, probably timing. Not the time yet for the gospel to be preached to Asia at the time. Later on, at the end of the uh, second missionary journey, Paul will come finally to Ephesus, and he will spend three and a half years in Ephesus. This is the longest period of time Paul ever spent during his missionary journey. The second one will be in Corinth, where he spent one and a half, half years. So if Paul and his team had gone to Ephesus, they might stay there for a very long time, and then people up in the north, in Thessalonica, and Greece, and Athens, and Corinth, probably will have uh, had a chance to hear the, the gospel. Urgency. Probably there's an urgency up there. We'll learn later that there was a lady named Lydia in the city of Philippi, worshiping the Lord, and he will be saved through the preaching, the message of the gospel. So sometimes... Holy Spirit will prevent this because there is a, not greater, but there is an urgency in other places or in different groups of people who need to hear now. And that place you can come always later uh, to preach the gospel. I mentioned this in the first uh, service. History is a little bit complicated, but I read recently the history of the first European came to Jakarta. By boat, they stopped in Banten, that is the end of Java Islands. At the time, the king of Banten, that is including all Jakarta, uh, all the way to Banten, was a Hindu king. And central Java was already Islamized. So the king of Mataram in uh, Jakarta were planning to attack Jakarta and Banten. And the king asked these Christians, come and fight with me. I will give my kingdom to be a, a Christian kingdom. I will, I will convert to Christianity. Come. They were not interested. They just sailed through, sailed past. Five years later, they came back. The whole region has been Islamized. Because, okay, uh, we can discuss about that. Uh, but sometimes you miss the, the opportunity. The windows of time sometimes open for a certain period of time. For those who learn about the house church and mission in China, will we'll witness that, that sometimes their doors are open, and you can go and preach the gospel, and suddenly there is a communist government will say, stop, no more, uh, and then it will be very hard to preach the gospel. So urgency, timing, but also, probably that work will be given to other people to do. It's not, it's not designed, designated for you. For example, in Bithynia and Cappadocia, uh, it was Peter went there later on to preach the gospel there. And when he, he writes 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 1, he says, to the Christians who live in Bithynia and Cappadocia and all this region. So the gospel went there through someone else. It was not through Paul. So if God closed the door for you to do certain things, maybe he's preparing someone else uh, to do that. You just need to pray and to obey to his uh, uh, leading. In our lives, also Christian life, sometimes Holy Spirit will say no to you. Including when you are tempted to do something that is sinful, you will hear the voice inside of you, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't go to that place. Don't go to the party. Don't go to the nightclub. Don't go there. There will be a danger waiting for you there. And if you are sensitive enough, you can hear that, you can avoid that, because he lives in us and warns us as well. Secondly, he permits, he directs. The first one was more negative. Yeah? You can see it's a negative leading of the spirit not to do certain things. But now it is more positive. You are led to do this. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. 
Uh, during the night, Paul had visions of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready and at once we leave for Macedonia, concluding, can be translated convincing, we believe strongly that God has called us to preach the gospel to uh, them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight uh, for Samothrace. And then the next day, we went to Neapolis, the other side. This is the first one in, in Europe, Greece. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of the first city of the district of Macedonia. The capital is Thessalonica. This is one of the most uh, important cities. And we stayed there several days. So the reason they came, they were led to come to Troas was that there is a need in Macedonia. They travel 400 miles, 644 kilometers. Someone counted that very specifically. 644 kilometers. You walk that distance led by the Holy Spirit because there's a need of people at this other side of the sea. Have you ever walked for 100 kilometers, 50 kilometers? The longest I've ever done is 20 kilometers uh, because there was no traffic, uh, there is no in, in the jungle many years ago. Uh, but these people, they walk that sacrifice that uh, just to obey the leading of the spirit. Nowadays we hop into the, the plane, went somewhere, stayed in the hotel, preached and came back. That was not the way uh, at the time. And uh, I believe at that night Paul will come to the Lord and he will pray. It doesn't mention here. It's not mentioned here. Lord, why are we here? Hundreds of kilometers. And then the Lord came to the vision of a Macedonian man calling them to cross, even begging to come. So the story is clear. Paul had a very uh, uh, vision, a clear vision. And then he shared his vision with his team, and his team believes and convinces that this is what God wants them to do. And not only that they believe, they obey. They went to the sea, got into the boat, and crossed over to the other side. Paul was a man, he was not only a learned man, he was not, a, not only a missionary, a strategist, a pastor. He was also a very spiritual man who always seeks after God's guidance. When he writes letter to the church in Corinth, he even says, I spoke in tongues more than all of you in my personal relationship with the Lord. He seeks after God. He relies on God. He wants to follow the steps the Holy Spirit in his personal life and in, in his work, and that's why God reveals him what he needs to do. Preaching the gospel anywhere, anytime, to anyone is always the will of the Holy Spirit. Whether you go to Ephesus or Bithynia, as always. <laughs> But sometimes Holy Spirit wants us to go to a specific group of people into a specific place during a specific period of time. Sometimes that is the prompting of the Spirit. Anyone in Indonesia needs the gospel. But sometimes Holy Spirit will guide you to specific people. When you sit in the airport lounge, probably everyone who sits there needs the gospel. But there might be someone specifically Holy Spirit wants you to go and talk to and pray for that person. Maybe he is going to a certain problems in his life. We are sitting 
in the airplane, the passenger sitting next to you may be in trouble, and you are suddenly prompted to speak to the person, and then that person begins to open his life. They will say, my neighbor, one who is very strong man, Arabic, uh, with long beard and strong man. I pass through his house every day. One day I felt this, I should speak to this man. It turns out he has lots of problems. He begins to open his life. And he went through lots of challenges in life. Uh, so, how to discern that? How to discern that this is what God wants me to do? You can study it. There are lots of things uh, that uh, you can learn. But the three C's here. Number one, this is, you have a, a strong conviction in your hearts that God wants you to do this. It is planted by the Holy Spirit inside of you. It's very clear for you. For Paul, it's very clear going there. You cannot sleep at night. You think about this during the day. Uh, when you are in the meetings, you keep thinking about this. This is something that God wants me to do. You, maybe you keep thinking about a specific person I need to call uh, and pray for the person. Maybe God wants you to do something. And secondly, uh, when you have that confession, it needs to con be conformed to the will and the ways of God. Because there is a self-prompting as well. Satan can prompt people to do certain things as well. So it needs to be conformed to the will and ways of For here, we know God wants to save people in Macedonia. This is part of his great plan, uh, plan which is correct. Otherwise, you need to, you need to fat it. Uh, I was told a story many years ago. There was a lady, sorry for wonderful ladies here, who came to a man and said, God told me to be your wife. Can you imagine someone came to you and said, God told me to be your wife. And the man said, I'm married. How can God tell you to, to come to me and I'm a married man? Other one will say, but God doesn't talk to me. Uh, then maybe I can be the second wife. There's no way because it's not in line with the spirit. Or a husband will come to you, God tells me to divorce you. That is not in line with the will and the ways of God. So, we need to always be in line with that. And it is good also to be confirmed by others. If you are doing things in the church, it might be good to have the confirmation from the leadership of the church, from your small group, uh, from those who are in authority. It is good to pray and come to them and ask of their advice and their counsel. If you are married, man or woman, it is very important to get the confirmation from your spouse. I have made tons of mistakes not listening to my wife. I think women are given something very special. They have the sensitivity, instinct, the good antenna that they can read of certain things, the danger that will come and they will warn you not to do that. When you recruit some people, they will come and say, you better don't do that. I have no good feeling for that. And we did anyway, and later on I will come and say, sorry, you were right. You were right. But sometimes the damage has been done. So if you're a married man or married woman, husband, it's always good to listen to the input of your uh, spouse and they are our helper anyway. They're sent by God to do so. Having said this, we also need to be reminded that being led by the Spirit does not mean that we don't need to make plan in our lives. I believe Paul and his team, they talk about plan. We need to go to these places. We need to do those things. Uh, having a prayerful planning is a biblical principle. So you read the book of Proverbs, the Gospel. Jesus talks about it's, it's always good to have a plan, but being open to the leading, the guidance 
of the Spirit, submit those to the Lord, and be prepared that things can change uh, along the way. Secondly, being led by the Spirit doesn't mean there will be no challenges or no problems in life. People sometimes think, because I'm led by the Spirit, I will have now no problems in life, no challenges. No. Even the next, next week's sermon will deal with Paul praying for a girl, and then as a result, they were put into prison. You follow the steps of the Spirit, and now you end up in prison. There are challenges. And um, I like this uh, later on, uh, or, or Paul's commitment of obeying the Spirit, even though he knows that there will be some problems along the way. And now, compelled by the Spirit, is another word used, being led by I'm going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying the good news of God's grace. So Holy Spirit has warned him. From city to city, town to town, there will be prison, hardship, you will face. Are you willing to do that? And he says, yes, because there's a greater purpose in my life. And I consider this nothing compared to this. So you follow the steps of the Spirit. You follow God. There will be some challenges. But when we are faced with challenges, he will provide us wisdom, counsels, way out, strength, peace. He has lots of these things given to us. If you are in the right place where God wants you to be, you are doing the things that God wants you to do. Don't worry. He will guide and he will lead you. David Livingstone, known as the Apostles of Africa. We have many brothers from Africa here. Uh, uh, he initially left Britain to go to China. This is his initial plan. But then Holy Spirit redirect his life to preach the gospel to Africa. He moved from jungle to jungle. And, and now, more than half of the continent is Christians. Muslims worry too much about Africa because Al Jazeera says that every year it estimated six million Muslims in Africa coming to Christ. We need to check again because it's from Al Jazeera. The country that in the early uh, 20th century, only small percentage of Christians living there, probably the Ethiopians, we have Ethiopian brothers here, uh, from Orthodox Church, now more than half are Christians. Because many years ago, God led this man to go there to preach the gospel. Twisted his arms. William Carey initially planned to go to Polynesia. And God led me to India instead. And everyone who studies our Indian brothers here, they can confirm that modern India is birthed actually through what God used uh, him to do through education, science, literature, and uh, lots of other things uh, there. Adoniran Judson, a missionary from America, planning to go to India. And then God opened the doors for him to go to Burma and planted churches there. Some of you plan to come to Indonesia for two weeks. Twenty years later, you are still here. Right? You are coming for holiday. A Mike has been here more than 30 years, and sometimes we joke and say, he might be an CIA agent here. I was joking. Yeah. Uh, you go for just a short period of time, you plan for just one year contract. 
10 years later, you are still here. God might have purpose for you. Uh, it is not your initial plan was. And what is a Macedonian calling for you? What is that? Well, we might not have a clear vision where God came to us during our sleep with a vision very clearly. You might have that, but he might plant the, something inside your hearts and minds. He might plant certain person in you to go and to share the gospel with. Certain ideas to do so. Uh, certain business ideas. Maybe you want to, those here who are entrepreneurs, they want to start business. How can I use this to bless more people, to expand the kingdom of God? And that makes you cannot sleep at night. You keep thinking about that, keep thinking about that. I talked with a friend last week. He said, I keep thinking about these things and I'm tired because I want to do this. I talk to people, no one understands that. So yeah, if God really gives to you, you need to begin to do something about that. Macedonian calling can be a person sitting to your de- next to your desk in the office or in the, in the flight or wherever. We need to preach the gospel to anyone, but sometimes there is a Macedonian man in our lives. We need to be sensitive uh, to that. Sometimes there is a lot of stories where someone is prompted to go there to speak to someone, it turns out that that one, that person is considering to commit suicide. Thank God that someone came and talked and prayed. So be open to that. Students of campus, we just have a college uh, campus. Many of them just live across the streets, the campus here. We just need to cross that. Or our friends, uh, uh, refugees, and many other groups that God can lead us to reach out to. Third leading is by providing. So number one, he prevents. Number two, he permits, he allows, he directs. Number three, he provides. On the Sabbath, when we, uh, on the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate to the river. That means there were not many Jewish people there, so they had to go outside the city, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the woman who had gathered there. So it is apparently only women came. There are not many men there. Um, and uh, it takes 10 men to form a synagogue. If you don't have 10 men, it's not going to build a, or to have institutions of synagogue. So probably there were not many Jewish men there. So the woman came there. And uh, one of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, or Thyatira, Thyatira. Uh, a dealer in purple clothes. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. There are a few things here that God, Holy Spirit, provides he, he provides a place where they could go and meet these, these people. They didn't know this place. They probably found it out when they were staying there in a couple of days. There were women who came there. And Holy Spirit provides people to minister to. He lets you that place. There might be people there that are ready to be ministered. And in this case, the woman. The women were there. Women and children tend to be more open to the gospel throughout the history. This is what people can say. 
uh, the more open. And even the communities that we work, if you have meetings, only women and children will come. Men were busy with the works. And, and it, is, it is good to have women there. And one particular woman is mentioned here by the name of Lydia. Lydia. Lydia is a businesswoman, this says here. Is a what you call that a dealer in purple clothes. This purple clothes was a very expensive uh, materials there. They were worn by uh, noble people and wealthy people. So it is it is a good business. It's very profitable business. And she's into this uh, this business. And she's a worshipper of God. Worshipper of God means she is not a Jew. She is a Gentile who, uh, who, who wants to believe and behaves like a Jew without becoming one, uh, like that. So see, see, if you have that heart, that means you are born in a Gentile, pagan world, but somehow you think about God seriously and you want to come and seek who is the true God. And in the God that is worshipped by the Jews, there is one living God, Yahweh. I want to know that. And she comes to that. She doesn't believe yet in the gospel because she hasn't heard that. But this is the person that God wants Paul and his team to preach to. And the Bible says she listened to the message and the Lord opened her heart. To respond to that message. It is like what happens um, a couple of weeks ago. I preached here oh, that lame man, he listened and he came to faith. This is how God works uh, in missions. You have to listen to the message first, and then the Holy Spirit will use the message to quicken your heart to believe in the gospel. Why? Because Ephesians 2, 1 says, you were dead in your sins and transgressions. Our hearts, our spirits were dead, like the, uh, the bones, the visions Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel chapter 36, 34. Dead spiritually. When you are dead spiritually, how can you respond to the gospel? So you have to hear the message. Now, can you imagine that? For this one woman and many later, God led Paul and his team to walk 644 kilometers to Troas, plus sailing across the sea so that this woman can hear the gospel. The first woman in Europe to believe as recorded through Paul. When they obeyed that, they didn't realize that. Paul probably had, had, had this idea not in his mind. He just followed step by step. But Holy Spirit has the bigger purpose, bigger plan. And he directs you. If you only obey, you will see it later. When Paul wrote the book of Romans, based on this experience and revelation of God, he says, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the message of Christ. People only come to faith after they hear the gospel. No other things, no other ways. Not through charitable works. We do a lot of charitable works. But I say, you feed people, they are not going to believe unless they hear the matches of the gospel. Through friendship, yes. Friendship, we can have closer friends with people so we can have opportunity to share. But unless they hear the gospel, they will not come to faith. That is the urgency. That's why we go to anywhere, any place. So people can hear, and through hearing, they come to faith. And when she came to faith, now, she provides her house for Paul and her team. She invited them. She even persuaded them. She was not, in Bahasa, we call Basabasi. What is that? Is 
just, okay, come and stay in my house. But deep inside, I said, I hope you say no. Something like that. And I heard you say, no, he was genuinely asking Paul, come and stay in my house. I came. And I believe not only her house, she provides also all other provisions they need uh, to continue to preach the gospel. And uh, she receives spiritual blessings. The number one, salvation in Christ. Now she gives what God has given to her for the kingdom. Her house, her resources for the expansion of uh, the kingdom. Uh, in missions, we always say, to, do, to be able to do the works of missions, you need prayer, efforts, and you need money to do that. So these three things are important. And some people like Lydia are called by God to do so. And ladies like Lydia are naturally wired to do things in terms of hospitality. They know that they're much better than men. They know how to take care of people. And uh, at the time, uh, inns, hotels, can be very filthy, dangerous, expensive, and often a bit more than just a brothels. So for Christians to travel, they need probably a Christian home, Christian people who can host them to give good sense of family and love. And Lydia does that well. And if we read in the Gospels, Jesus and his team were also taken care of by a group of women in Acts chapter 8. They took care of all the needs of the, uh, Jesus and his team. Maybe the ladies at GICF can start a ministry called Lydian Ladies, double L, Lydian Ladies. Who also started that? Uh, to provide hospitality, uh, other things that the ladies, the ladies are given is a huge potential in the ladies in the church. Often half of the church, more than half, are ladies who have giftings, resources, abilities, and Often we don't use that that much. Come on, ladies, to be inspired by this lady uh, and and do things for the kingdom. Hudson Taylor once says, "There's a missionary to China. Uh, China in the mission says, God's works done in God's ways will never lack God's supply. God's works." Done in God's ways, you'll never lack God's supply. This is his work, his kingdom. He leads you to a certain place. He leads you to start something. He leads you to do things. Don't be too much worried about his provisions. He will provide people you need. He will provide place you need. He will provide resources uh, you need as you do that. To close, then we call for practical uh, life, we call us, what shall I do to be led by the Spirit? I will mention three things. Later on, pa, Supano will <laughs> complement that uh, even more comprehensive, the things we'll do to be led by uh, the Spirit in our lives. Based on this story, we just said, yes, we have tuned in to the voice of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. As a believer, you have the Spirit living inside of you, and He desires to speak to you. Tune in. Listen. As you read the Bible every day, it says the Bible is living and active. Uh, Hebrew 4, 12. The Word of God is living and active. As we read, it speaks to us a life. Because it's the living word of God. It is not only the document that comes from ancient world centuries ago. It is the living word of God that speaks to us as we listen, as we read, as we contemplate. Uh, listen to that. And as you read, 
Maybe certain things coming out from the verses of the Bible that prompt you to do certain things in your lives, to prevent you. Be sensitive to his promptings. Promptings sometimes are related to very specific situations and uh, conditions in your lives. As I mentioned earlier, preaching the gospel to anywhere, anyone is always the plan of God, but sometimes the Holy Spirit will prompt you to reach out to speak to certain people. And oftentimes it will save your life if you are always sensitive to that. I mentioned it in, in the first service that I think in the year 2000, 99, 2000, I was working with a mission organization in Lombok. Many of you have gone there, beautiful island there. We are doing community project in one village. We are taking materials in the open truck, very fast uh, going. I was leaning at the back door of the truck. Uh, and suddenly there was a prompting, like a voice or something, just pushing me, move to the, move to the side. I just moved. In the seconds, the back door fell off. It fell off. I thought, wow, it's just late few minutes. Uh, probably I'm already in heaven, faster than I expected. Uh, and a friend told me that hey, maybe God still allows you to live or something. Yeah, I never forget that. It was in 1999. Uh, I never forget that. It's still alive in my mind. And many other stories uh, recently uh, I shared here as well. We have a meeting. And then it was a prompting in my heart to go home uh, to see my wife. I canceled all the meetings. I didn't know anything, just, just obey and go there and found her unconscious on bed. But it was soon enough, so we could rush her to the hospital. And many other stories. You have also stories about that. If you expect that, Pastor Pano will explain uh, later. You're open to that because it lives inside of us. And um, because this is very personal and subjective, also causes is needed when you say that Holy Spirit wants me to do certain things. Confirmations, wisdom is needed. For example, if you are prompted to speak to someone at the airport, you will say, you don't go and say, hey, who are you? Holy Spirit told me to talk to you. Do you have any problems, any things? No, probably it's not wise to do so. But you can just go there and have conversations and maybe that person can open up and share. Um, um, and the last one is obey. So obey. When you get the confirmations, you have peace inside of you. Obey it. And God will open the door gospel will be preached and the name of God will be glorified. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for Holy Spirit living inside of us as believers who desires to communicate with us, to guide us, to lead us, to warn us not to do certain things, but also to guide us to do certain things. Uh, we pray, Father, that as believers who have this Holy Spirit, we might be open, be sensitive through the Word of God to obey you in our lives. We pray for those of us here who haven't believed in Jesus, that might open their hearts, like Lydia, to receive salvation and the Holy Spirit in the lies. In the name of Jesus we pray and give thanks. Amen. Please stand.